Welcome back. Good start to trade. Nifty holding with solid gains. So let's get uh, stock specific then. Goldrich Consumer, the quarter three business update suggested that the FMCG sector is visiting a, uh, witnessing a bit of a slowdown post the festive season and weak demand from the rural segment as well. To assess demand, the growth outlook from year on, we're joined by Samir Shah, CFO at Goldrich Consumer, who joins in. Hi, Samir. Morning. Thanks so much for joining in. Well, before we get to the numbers and you know, the other, uh, other nitty gritties, I want to focus on the rural space first. You know, we've been getting some mixed uh, feelers in the last couple of weeks or so that maybe there is signs of a bit of a bounce back. For you, rural, I think, is 30%, right? Are you echoing the same, that rural India could be bottoming up? Good morning, Nigel, and thanks for having me on the show. No, you're right. I mean, over the last three, four quarters, uh, rural has been quite sluggish, generally, for the sector. But for us, in the last quarter, rural growth was matching urban growth, which still is lower as compared to the historical trends, wherein rural has outperformed by 1.5x or 1.7x to urban. So having said that, rural has been impacted largely due to inflation, uh, which we have seen over the last uh, three, four quarters. Going ahead, we do expect rural consumption to recover gradually because inflation will come down as we are seeing driven by the drop in key commodities and also a lot of infrastructure investments uh, which are um, getting executed as we speak and also expected over the next three, four quarters. Samir, uh, there is, is there a, uh, good morning, is there a pre-election year uh, kind of uh, cyclicality that you, that you see, that you've seen in earlier uh, years, earlier periods? Uh, government spending goes up, especially, uh, you know, more money in the hands of the uh, sort of potential rural consumer, that kind of thing. Uh, does that also come into play? Good morning, Prashant. Yeah, it's quite likely. That's because not just of uh, heightened investments uh, in run-up to the election, but also because of low basis, which we have had in rural over the last three, four quarters. I think it should also get complemented with the inflation uh, abating over a period of time. So, yeah, it looks like there could be a little bit of a bout of upswing in rural over the next uh, four, five uh, quarters, driven by a mix of a lot of these factors. Mm. Uh, so, can you give us an update on how different verticals are doing, Samir? Uh, how was the performance in the household insecticide segment? That's been a segment that has been a laggard for you in the past. And overall as well, home care, personal care, what are the kind of growth trends that you see? Hi, Sonia. Good morning. This quarter, I think, was one of the best quarters in terms of having a very broad-based uh, growth for us. So, both the larger categories in India, home care as well as personal care, did you see a double-digit uh, growth rate? I think this has happened after maybe six or seven or you know quarters for us. And within the home care and personal care category, all the subcategories, which is household insecticides or air fresheners, or in personal care, hair colors or personal wash, have done extremely well. So this quarter has been quite robust in terms of very broad-based uh, growth for us across all the major as well as uh, subcategories in which we play. Okay, Mangalam is also here. Uh, of course, as you know, he tracks the stock very closely. Mangalam, over to you. Well, uh, hi, Samir. You know, as far as uh, the growth is concerned, etc., we, we have some of uh, the data that you've given. One of the worries on the street also was with regards to management and the leadership. I mean, just wanted you to reassure that uh, there is no change uh, in the near future when it comes to the leadership, etc., right? Absolutely. Hey, Manglam. Good morning. Yeah, I mean, those I mean, rumors were all rubbish, to be honest, I think. Thankfully, your channel also carried the news on the same day that management has uh, sort of, uh, you know, rubbished all those, you know, kind of claims or rumors. And there is absolutely nothing, I mean, in it. It's uh, more of the same as what we have been having since last, you know, kind of 12 to 18 months under the new leadership. Right. And uh, as far as Indonesia is concerned, how long before it goes into positive territory? Because... Now, the growth uh, decline has been stemmed. How long before it goes into positive and what's the steady state uh, growth expected there? Yeah, I think maybe a quarter or so more, Manglam, of, uh, you know, kind of uh, weak performance or soft performance, I would say. And then come FI24, we should start seeing uh, meaningfully, uh, you know, kind of steady performance to strong performance in Indonesia. What we have been doing over the last couple of quarters is putting in a lot of input matrix, whether it be on category development initiatives or whether it be on route to market in Indonesia, which I think should complement with uh, good macros, what we're seeing in the markets locally. So to that extent, uh, we do expect uh, maybe after quarter four, a much improved performance and not just for one year, but hopefully for many more years to come in Indonesia. Okay. All right. Uh, Samir, uh, you know, raw material costs have cooled off. So... 
gross margins are likely to recover. I think you hinted about that as well, and that should be, uh, you know, obvious for the second half of this year. Could you quantify what kind of a gross margin improvement we're looking at? That's point number one. And how much of that saving that you'll be, uh, you know, uh, enjoying be plowed back into advertising and other expenditure, promotion expenditure? Yeah, I think one thing about last quarter, which we're also very uh, happy with, is the quality of profits, Nigel. So, you know, the gross margins are expanding, the so-called controllable costs are going down. Uh, we are using that pool for reinvesting in terms of uh, marketing investments. And all said and done, the EBITDA margins mostly will, you know, kind of be maintained in last quarter to very marginally expanding. But going ahead, we do expect this trajectory of gross margin expansion to continue. One, because the commodity prices are lower on a YY basis. We don't expect any meaningful shift in commodity trends, at least over the next uh, three, four quarters globally. Uh, and also we have low basis. Uh, so some part of it will get reinvested back for growth and some part of it will go towards expansion in the overall uh, operating profits. So that's the game plan which we have at least for the next four, five quarters. Samir, you want to quantify that gross margin expansion? What could it be? A couple of hundred basis points in the second half. And also if you could tell us the updated uh, Ad spends as a percentage of sales, I think it was around 8, 8.5%. You could correct me on that number. But what's the ideal uh, spend as a percentage of sales? Well, I think on the former, it's difficult to quantify, Nigel, because there are too many moving parts in terms of uh, mix, in terms of pricing, in terms of commodity trends. But directionally, as I said, there will be expansion in gross margins, at least for next four to five quarters on a year-over-year -year basis. I think on ad spends, uh, typically, I mean, there is no thumb rule, but uh, HPC... FMCG companies would have ad spends anywhere in range of 10 to 12 percentage. Having said that, we are relatively on the lower end of the band. So we do expect our ad spends to sort of, uh, you know, move up uh, gradually. Having said that, we will also focus equally on the quality of spends and not just quantity of spends. Okay, so that's good to hear that there would be an expansion in gross margins at least for the next four to five quarters. Earlier, you had said that your volume growth overall will improve to mid-single digits in the second half of the year. Would you want to stick to that guidance? Would you want to change it given how you know challenging the rural environment is? Yeah, I think at this point in time, we do believe that for second half of the year, the volume trajectory would be very robust as compared to what we have seen over the last uh, three, four quarters. Uh, some of the category development initiatives are... Uh, reaping rich dividends uh, on that front. So, yeah, I mean, we should see much improved performance in H2. But interestingly, Sonia, for next year, we remain uh, quite optimistic in terms of robust volumes um, in key markets like India as well as Indonesia. Okay, we will let you go on that note. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in and all the best for the quarters to come. Uh, since we started talking about Godrich Consumer and the management talking about, you know, gross margin expansion, let's also tell you what you can expect from the earnings season, quarter se, quarter tak. This is our segment where we talk about expectations from the FMCG space. So, Mangalam, take it away. Well, as far as the FMCG sector this time around is concerned, it witnessed some important trends in the third quarter. And here's what one can expect from the companies that will report their numbers. Demand moderation post-festive season, that's point number one. Then there is weakness in rural India. There have been some moderation in raw material prices, but demand for premium and discretionary has remained steady. Expected margin improvement and rural demand improvement will be likely only post the fourth quarter. From the updates that we have so far, discretionary as well as premium are doing well, whereas staples and rural focused have struggled for growth. For instance, Titan has recorded an 11% growth in their jewellery business on a high base. Marico, on the other hand, recorded mid-single digit volume growth itself. Godrej Consumer too reported low single digit volume growth and Dabur's EBITDA margins actually seen lower by about 200 to 250 basis points. DMART on the other hand has seen its third quarter standalone revenue grow by around 25%. As far as the expectations from companies are concerned, Britannia is expected to top the list with a 19 to 20% growth, HUL around 14 to 15 odd percent. These are revenue estimates by a bunch of analysts. Asian paints around 12 to 13%, whereas we would see around 7 to 8% growth for the ITC cigarette division as well as uh, Tata consumers' uh, revenue. But more than the numbers, it's important to watch the management commentary this time on what they're viewing demand trends to be, their views on product and pricing trends. Uh, are companies reinvesting cross margin savings back into ad spends to spur demand? And the joker in the pack, of course, will be the rural demand recovery. Companies like Parley, etc., in the past have said to us that there have been some green shoots in rural demand in the latter part of December. Uh, so the big trigger for rural uh, recovery would be easing commodity inflation, higher crop realizations, ongoing government interventions. We've seen a few being announced and a likely stimulus 
from the union budget. All of that could spur rural demand. But importantly, as far as valuations are concerned, FMCG stocks have always traded at stiff PE multiples. This time around, they're likely to, uh, you know, uh, look at these uh, PE multiples itself from mildly off their earlier levels, but still about 10 to 15% premium as compared to their long-term averages. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, Shirish Pardeshi, who's the FMCG analyst at Centrum, joins us now to talk about that. Uh, Shirish, good morning and thanks for joining in. Uh, first, I wanted your thoughts on the management commentary that we got from GCPL a while back, uh, where they do talk about gross margin expansion despite all the challenges that they're seeing. Is it a stock that you like? Uh, I think uh, uh, I did hear what Samir has said. Uh, what you have to keep in mind uh, and at the backdrop, uh, which Samir did point out, second half of the quarter, we have seen a little dullness. And this is not particularly for one company. It's across uh, the mass consumption, which has faltered. And I think in that context, uh, there are two scenarios. Either the demand is holding up, and that's what my feel is that people are stressed with the inflation. And that's why the demand is holding up. And that's why most of the companies are saying that we are seeing some green shoots, uh, which is going to come back uh, maybe end of uh, second, uh, fourth quarter. The second point is that uh, the, 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 uh, the other thought is that what we are estimating that the inflation will uh, taper down. Uh, but I suspect uh, at least that you look at the various data point doesn't give that confidence that quarter four, your inflation is going to settle down. And that's why my little difference uh, opinion uh, that we might see that there are green shoots, but I suspect that the mass consumption will still see some challenges and some stress on the wallet share. Okay, hi, Suresh. Uh, you know, but uh, we just spoke to the management of Godrej Consumer. They were indicating gross margin expansion. Some part of that will be visible, I think, in quarter three, but I think bulk of it will be quarter four. So for the industry on the whole, uh, you know, what kind of an expansion are you working with? If you could give us a couple of numbers, if you were to talk stock specific also, if you'd give us a sense on that front. I just repeat it. Uh, what I'm saying that I suspect that quarter for margin expansion will, which will be more than 30, 40, 50 basis points. The reason, is, the reason is that your winter has spoiled uh, the entire demand cycle. And if the winter is going to get extended in the month of January, February, you will have to spend uh, our investments into the marketing a in terms of promotion or giving a lot of uh, freebies to the trade or to attract the consumer to get your demand back and second uh, directionally historically uh, the quarter three budgets for the ad spends is little higher maybe you call it as the festive season or the winter portfolio but as you said uh, the second half of the quarter was little dull Maybe my sense is that the ad spends and promotion spends will get spilled over in quarter four. That's why I suspect not much margin expansion, which will be visible for most of the companies. Mm. Should you track Asian paints? Uh, uh, sorry, track I Asian, didn't get the question. Asian paints? Do you track Asian paints? Yes. So in, in terms of Asian paint, uh, 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 what we found on the ground, uh, that the demand conditions are very strong. And there are two things. Uh, if you look mm -hmm. at the heightened price increases, which has happened over last 17, 18, quarter, uh, 17, 18 uh, months is in the tune of over 27%. I think the trade is holding off because uh, like us, every even the mm -hmm. trade also watches the quarter on week on week uh, fall in the crude and crude derivative prices. So what I can confirm, uh, having spoken to the trade, uh, is that the primary demand has taken a toll because the trade is expecting a sharp decrease in the prices by all these paint companies. However, reality, it has not happened. So what I can only say that what we gather uh, with our interaction that the demand is going to be uh, higher mid single digit. While the, the margin story may pan out for the paint companies, but the revenue growth will be uh, mid to high single digit, uh, high, high double digit. What about Titan? Uh, what What is your view on the update? I mean, the stock is under pressure despite your 12-13% growth. You think it's once again valuation concerns? Yeah, thank you, Sonia. Your observation is absolutely right. Uh, even I was a bit surprised uh, the nervousness uh, what the investors have shown on the name. I think uh, under, under current jewelry demand, uh, and we have to also consider that last year, quarter three, we had a very strong base uh, where the jewelry demand was very strong. What we gather this point of time, all these uh, big ticket weddings has happened and some spillover will definitely happen in quarter four. So my view is that 
uh, your grammage growth or what we call it as a gra uh, volume growth will be high single digit uh, because the other factor which is also important that the gold prices has stabilized. And I think that will also call for the redemption and uh, the encashment of the uh, investment uh, in the advanced purchase what the most companies have done. So I would I would say that it could be a, at this point of time an aberration what people are saying uh, that the discretionary may not perform. I think that's the market call. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Suresh, for, for stopping by and filling us in with uh, your take on the sector. We look forward to touching base with you all through earnings season. In fact, get a recap, maybe post that as well. But let's focus on Mahindra and Mahindra. The XUV 400 EV is upcoming and the highly anticipated electric XUV from Mahindra and Mahindra. Well, the auto major will start bookings of this new vehicle on January 25th. The, you know, this particular segment will offer a range of from 456 kilometers on a single full charge as per Indian driving cycle with a peak power of around 149.5 PS and a max stock of around 310 Nm. Sonia caught up with Rajesh Jajurikar, the ED auto and farm sectors at Mahindra and Mahindra and began by asking about the business opportunities in the EV space. Let's hear him out. Very excited and uh, we'll start test drives and bookings very soon, middle of Jan. And uh, Sorry, test drives and we'll announce the price uh, middle of Jan and start bookings towards the end of Jan. Okay, you know, I just, I mean, this was the first time I drove the car. Yeah. And it does not disappoint. Yeah. I've driven a couple of EVs and it's abs an absolutely new segment that you're getting into. Yeah. I remember you telling us a while back that, you know, this uh, C category segment has an opportunity of about 30,000 vehicles. B category has 60,000, so it's a cumulative 90,000 units in the IC engine segment. Right. And now you're hoping for that transition to happen to EVs. Will that take a lot of time? So, yeah, you're right. So, 90,000 is the segment size, and the penetration in C is like less than 1% right now of EVs. And it's 2 to 3% in B. So, it's, it's a very big opportunity by way of ability to convert. And, you know, as we thought about segmentation here, there are multiple different reasons why people may want an EV. Uh, it could be because you just need to be close by, so you're a doctor or a lawyer, you live here and you want to get to your place of work, it's not a lot of running, so you don't get worried about range too much. Uh, then there's those who just want to buy because they want to optimize costs. And then there's those who want to buy EV because it's also a lifestyle statement. You know, the experience you've just driven in this and you'll realize that it's a totally different experience of how you feel when you're driving it, the level of comfort, of course the noise is noiseless and, and the pep you'll We'll go for a spin in it, I guess you're going to drive some more. Yes, I am. I'm looking forward to it. And, you and know, I don't want you to try it, but you can do 0 to 108.3 seconds. 8.3 seconds, seconds, that's fast. Yeah, that's even faster than XUV 7 double loop, by the way. And the total, uh, and there's absolutely no range anxiety with this one, right? I think it's a 460 kilometer range. Yeah, 460 is under the test conditions, but uh, obviously when you drive on road, you'll depending on what conditions you're driving in, you'll get something may be lower but 456 is what we have on the test condition okay so you know the pricing is not out yet but i do know there are reports suggesting it's between 17 and 20 lakhs wow you know everything you can. <laughs> <laughs> i do my research well but you know this is a segment that's a, in a slightly premium ev side yeah. there are of course cheaper ones as well are you looking to target the lower range anytime soon no we are not looking to target a lower range because like i said you know the market is really b2c uh, C itself is a large market. Uh, you know, the current uh, seg C segment market is about uh, 30,000 a month, you said. So that's a large market to, you know, look at trying to drive EV conversion. And even B has a big market. Uh, we are focusing on living true to our brand purpose and brand value, which is really to give vehicles which are fun, authentic, uh, you know, adventure ready. And this is that. So you're going to, when you drive it, you're going to get an experience which is exhilarating. Uh, so we don't want to get into the, uh, so to say, shared mobility segment with electric and play in the fleets and cabs. That's not the segment we are playing in. This is personal use for those who are looking for a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, the modes are called fun, fast and furious. Okay. Yeah. So when you go into the third mode, which is furious, you literally fly. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that <laughs> with my seatbelt on for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, you tried something different this time, right? Uh, three months ago in September, you launched it, and then you had these customer experiences that you did for three months before booking. Yeah. Uh, did that work out differently, and what was the response from customers? 
Yeah, so you know the reason for doing that, it's a new category. We, you know, want to spend time understanding, interacting with customers, getting feedback. So we've done all of that. Uh, and we feel now is the time to open it up for large scale test drives and uh, uh, announce the price and then do bookings a few weeks later. And have you gone from 0 to 108.3 I have, seconds? I, I have, I have, on the test track though. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what the near term plans are in the SUV space. What kind of market share are you targeting, both in EVs as well as in ICE engines? What are you looking at? Um, so, you know, we are focusing, and now I'm talking about SUV broadly, we are focusing on what we're calling revenue market share. The reason we say that is our average selling price is roughly twice that of the most other players in the industry, right? So, volume by itself will not always be a representation. And we may be, you know, one, two, three on volume. Last uh, couple of months, we've been a close number two. Two months before that, we were number one. Uh, but we really think the right metric for us is revenue market share. So we want to be number one on revenue market share, which right now is in the region of 19.5 to 20 uh, percent. On EVs, I think the many factors which are going to drive penetration. Uh, and we've got to be, I, I think we're going to get a very good response when we open bookings. But then we also got to plan supply chain, uh, delivery, uh, help people get charging set up in their societies and homes. So there's a process. Uh, so it's a new segment and we go, can't think about it exactly the way we think about ICE. So you, are you on track for deliveries by Jan, Feb? Because the supply chain issue is coming back again. There's a little bit of a chip shortage yeah. issue. How are you handling that? We, we are hoping to do uh, our delivery starting last week of Feb. Mm -hmm. We'll do a, probably a first vehicle earlier and you'll more, hear more about that soon. Uh, so that's the designer vehicle, right? So I don't know if you saw it. We've done a fa tech fashion show. Uh, where we have a vehicle developed, uh, designed by Pratap Bose and uh, Rinjin Dagu, uh, who is a top fashion designer. So that's going to be the first vehicle which we'll deliver. And we'll do that first sometime in early Feb and then start the rest of the deliveries towards the end of Feb. So there are two concerns, right, on supply side, uh, as you mentioned, and also on production. Uh, I understand that the XUV400 shares its production capacity with the, the 300. Uh, and over there, you're full on capacity. So is it going to be a struggle to roll out production for this one? No, I don't think there's going to be any struggle in the plant. Uh, the if at all there's a struggle, it's going to be related to availability of uh, the battery pack and uh, maybe some semiconductors, which is impacting, starting to impact again a little bit, nowhere near like what it was earlier. But uh, that's what we'll have to watch for. So. Uh, so we, so I, I think we'll get a good, very good customer response. How well we are able to execute that is something we need to stay focused on. But this 30,000 segment is big, right? I it mean, C-suite uh, segment. Yeah. So no. So I, I think we'll get a good customer demand. We really need to still establish uh, what is the run rate at which we do to produce. Okay, there are two more cars coming <laughs> in December 2024 as well as in Jan 2025. Uh, tell us about that and what is the expectation from that one? Yeah, so they, they are uh, what we call the Bond Electrics and that's the whole new portfolio which we're creating on the Inglo platform. Uh, so, they, like you said, there'll be two to three products between 20, three which are defined, which are in stages of execution, uh, two under the XUV brand. Uh, one is what we call XUV E8 and then XUV E9 and one which is under the B brand. So, you know, we're launching a new electric brand called B, and uh, that's, that's called B05. Uh, so between 24, 25, we'll see these three products come in, and uh, they're very exciting to look at. Uh, we plan to get a couple of them uh, to India for everyone to look at, and hopefully you can take a look in on that. Okay, so that's an interesting uh, conversation, and uh, you know, uh, Sonia will be. I will, uh, I'll ask Sonia for a comment. <laughs> She's with us. Sonia, <laughs> I believe you drove drove in an XUV. I did. I did. It was amazing. It's yeah. a. Really no, I nice meant in, uh, to office. <laughs> 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 no, no, not yet. No, not yet. <laughs> I drove on the track though. The, uh, we the saw track that, that they have in Kandavi. Pretty good. Yeah, it is. Um, it goes from zero to hundred in eight seconds. Eight seconds. So wow. If you ever want to try it, <laughs> with seatbelts on, <laughs> as you said. <laughs> All right, you know, uh, take a look at uh, the market, right? Uh, 200 points, uh, what, 18,070 is where we read. And, uh, you know, this is what I was talking about, that uh, for every time, I mean, you know, and you know, once bitten, twice shy, as they say, uh, when data is faltered in the U.S., I mean, this is weak as good, is the regime, right? I mean, you want bad data out of the U.S. for things to calm down, for the Fed to chill down. 
Uh, and you've had those uh, weaker data points, et cetera, which have come through, markets have reacted, and then they've gone back to being uh, extremely weak. Uh, but I think Friday's data was consequential on the ISM services front because services inflation is sticky and that has dropped. Uh, and now pretty much all high frequency data points, PMI, ISM manufacturing and now services, everything uh, is uh, s sort of showing sharp disinflation. So the number one problem for markets, which is, you know, high rates, uh, rising rates, perhaps, I think uh, it'll, it'll uh, kind of at least we will see some deliberation that maybe uh, rates perhaps stay higher uh, for longer, but whether they'll keep climbing at the same pace, I think more debate. Uh, and that is good news. I mean, 200 points now on the Nifty, uh, 18,071. By the way, the rest of the Asian markets are doing well. Hang Seng, I think, is up about 3%. Uh, but China, of course, uh, has had a different reaction function with a sharp underperformance uh, that we've seen over the last uh, year, year and a half or so. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We are back. Mitesh will be with us. Technical trading ideas, how to trade this now. Uh, we'll also have, uh, uh, you know, uh, more on uh, markets when we return in just a bit. All right, 200 points and uh, 18,070. Midesh is with us. Uh, Midesh, uh, morning again. Uh, welcome back. Uh, what would you do? A strong market. Uh, morning, Prashant. Uh, very strong market, and uh, it's you know after the gap, uh, we are continuously seeing the markets head up. So I think very clearly, as I said, I think you know now shorting should be done only if you break seventeen eight hundred. Till then, I think avoid it. On the stock side, gas authority is moving to a new swing high, so I would recommend that as a long call with a stock at about ninety seven half and a target uh, of around one zero two to begin with. The other stock which I like is Escorts. Uh, that's also given very positive uh, crossovers on the indicator and the averages chart. So by year with the stock below 2175 and a target of around 2250, 2260 and believe that. Okay, thanks a lot, Mitesh, for that. Have a good day. We'll touch base with you again later. Let's shift focus to the commodity markets now. Manisha Gupta is joining in. Manisha, what's the one commodity you're looking at today? Sonia, a lot of uh, positive cues coming in from the commodity space as well. But I'm looking at the crude oil prices because after that very weak uh, start to the month of January, we've seen some more uh, some support come in finally for the crude oil prices. But we are still trading below $80 per barrel. The support comes in from the fact that you are looking at the US dollar index just about holding 104 or trading below that. The US non-farm payroll data is what the markets are digesting right now. And the expectation that there is going to be a less aggressive US monetary tightening when the US Fed meets for the first time in 2023 for the month in the month of Feb there. The markets also are looking at hopes of demand recovery in China. Remember, they have opened the Hong Kong border starting today. There's stimulus and liquidity injections that China has just about continued to do. That has been supportive. And then there's a report from Pierre and Duran who says that the oil prices could exceed $140 a barrel in the second quarter in this year rather uh, if Asia reopens fully. So that is one thing that the street is watching out for. But having said that, there's a big but there because global excess supply as of now stands at 1 million barrels per day. So the markets still are looking at that incremental demand to come back. Also, while China is buying crude, but they are storing it. So that's not a very good news, really. And they actually are exporting refined products out of the country. So within China, the domestic demand is still on the weaker side. And how much crude will China import? And will it start dipping into it? Will it buy it more? Are all the questions that the street is right now battling with. And when you look at the Russian Urals, well, they are sold, be, being sold to China and India at $58 to $59 a barrel. Remember, the current Brent prices are trading at a $79 a barrel. So we are looking at a $20 discount here. And not just Russia. If you look at Saudi Arabia, they also have slashed their prices to six-month lows to Asia and Europe as well. That tells you that the demand is on the weaker side and many of these producers really are making uh, effort to keep sending or selling their crude into the market there. Until time, we have uh, seen a decline of 8% in 2023. 2022 did see 11% of a gain, and that was second straight year of gains into the market. But the street believes that first quarter of this year is going to be on the bearish side as the market looks at excess supply, weak manufacturing data, and the fact that the Russia is selling at a deep discount. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, let's slip into a short break. On the other side, Lata will connect with Samiran Chakraborty of City and Indranil Sengupta of CLSA India to discuss India's growth for 2023. After the NSO announced, it expects FY23 GDP growth to slow to 7% in its first advance estimate. Welcome back. The NSO, the National Statistical Organization, has said FY23 real GDP Real GDP adjusted for inflation will grow at 7%, while nominal GDP, that is without adjusting for prices, will grow by 15.4%. Obviously, because this year inflation has been higher. 
What does this mean for FY24 growth assumptions? We have uh, two economists, Samanan Chakraborty, Chief Economist for India at City, and Indranil Sengupta, Head of Research and Economist at CLSC India, both join us now. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, Samiran, first up, any squabble with the 7% and 15.4% uh, number that the NSO has put out? Uh, good morning, Lata. I think the headline numbers are pretty similar to what uh, our expectation was. Uh, the mm, little bit of difficulty in understanding the data has been that uh, the NSO data seems to suggest that in H2 of FY23, there will be a marginal degrowth in uh, consumption, particularly private consumption. And that has been counterbalanced by the fact that NSO is expecting uh, net exports to be uh, growing at a significant 13% rate in the second half of the year. Uh, so this does not quite gel with our understanding of how the consumption data is. Yes, consumption is growing, but we don't think that this is as bad as calling for a degrowth in the second half. Okay. Uh, yes, I did see your implied second half growth table. And uh, you point out that by the NSO's figures, full year figures, if you subtract the first half, you get a private consumption of minus 0 0.2. Uh, well, Indranil, what is your sense? Uh, is consumption slowing that much? Do you think we will get an upside surprise in the real GDP? Or uh, is, is consumption really so slow? And we may actually get a downside because most of the people I interviewed were speaking about 6.9, 6.8. That is not 7%. So we did have 7%, by the way. Uh, we do think consumption as an issue. Uh, you know, if you look at Kharif farm income, that is slowing to about 5% uh, from 16% uh, last year. So that's one. And, uh, you know, when we did a survey uh, uh, pre Diwali, uh, what the one thing that comes out very clearly is that uh, while the relatively better off sections are, uh, you know, uh, have recovered from COVID, the mass uh, is still, uh, uh, you know, cutting consumption. So I think that uh, the economy is. Uh, you know, heading uh, slower. Uh, if you look at the numbers, mm. which most of us have, okay. average growth for the next second half is around four and a half percent. Yeah. Okay. And consumption also, the rate of growth should be slowing at least. Okay. Well, I think Samiran also admits it is slowing, but he is not able to believe it will contract from year ago levels. Uh, Samiran, you know, you all have now today uh, released a report uh, which is tracking current growth versus pre-COVID growth trend, correct? What is that showing in terms of uh, consumption? And I want to ask you in specific, because the Q3 advance estimates we got, you know, companies like Bajaj Electricals actually spoke of an intense slowdown, much more than previous uh, or pre-COVID years. So your assessment of uh, your new tracker? Well, our tracker is uh, going to tell you about what is the current uh, sequential growth rate, uh, a growth momentum, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the growth momentum was pre-COVID, because we believe that we have almost uh, whatever decline happened during COVID, that has completely been uh, taken care of now. So going forward, this growth uh, assessment will be more important than anything else. Uh, what this is telling us is that uh, the exceptional growth momentum in urban consumption, uh, that has uh, come off. Uh, whereas rural is just about holding up steady. Uh, so the urban and rural, they are now almost converging in terms of their growth momentum. And the investment growth momentum still continues at a pretty decent clip. So all in all, our growth momentum tracker is showing that the current growth momentum is similar to what we had seen pre-COVID. What happened in the last few months is that uh, probably we got a mixed uh, festive season. And post the festive season, there is generally a little bit lull. And now we are seeing some improvement. But compared to where we were in the middle of 2022, that was the height of sequential momentum as the reopening trade fully played out. Now that part is behind us. So we would expect a slightly slower growth momentum 
uh, going forward uh, based on some other factors like uh, the urban consumption slowing down on the back of excess savings of the households being a, a factor which we might not be enough supporting anymore. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I will want to come back to you on the consumption slowdown. But uh, uh, what's your assessment, Indranil, for uh, both the second half as well as, more importantly, the coming FY24? Uh, what is your estimate of uh, consumption? Will we be able to grow faster than the pre-COVID uh, trend growth? As much lower? So I think consumption will slow because we are looking at uh, uh, a situation where uh, you have export demand slowing because of uh, slower global growth and you have higher lending rates at home. So growth in, it will slow and, uh, you know, logically consumption should also also slow. Uh, like I said, you know, whatever uh, trackers we do use, uh, none of them are particularly optimistic, including on rural, because uh, rural demand, uh, like I said, has slowed. The winter, Ravi crop should be good because there's good water uh, in, in, in the northern rivers. But then again, there is talk of uh, El Nino and we have to see how that plays out before uh, we take a call. Okay. Uh, Sabiran, you, are, uh, uh, you believe rural demand is improving? So let me put it this way, that uh, there are some uh, very early uh, green shoots on, on rural. Uh, if you look at rural agri part, uh, the sowing activity for the winter crop has been good. Uh, we are seeing, after a long time, some sequential momentum in rural farming wage growth. Uh, and we have also seen some decline in uh, Narega demand. Uh, we've seen both center and state governments revenue expenditure increasing as well as uh, construction activity in rural areas improving, particularly rural housing and rural roads. So all that should start affecting positively the rural uh, non-farming sector as well. But we are not yet seeing a significant improvement in rural uh, non-farming wage growth, which is still around 5% year over year, although there has been a very marginal sequential improvement there as well. So our thesis is that once the wage growth uh, kind of crosses the inflation rate and real wage growth turns positive in rural, uh, that's probably the turn time to be uh, more positive about rural consumption. Uh, but uh, having said that, some of the indicators on a rural uh, farming side, like uh, tractor sales, fertilizer sales, etc., is clearly indicating that uh, things are better than what it was uh, maybe three, four months back. Uh, companies told us that uh, upper echelons, tractor sales are doing well, but uh, they don't have that much uh, of positive data to speak about anything smaller, uh, especially FMCG packs. Samiran, your table also says waiting for liftoff when you're uh, discussing, when you're giving us the investment graphs. Uh, you're, you're not confident of the private capex cycle? Uh, as of now, a large part of this whatever improvement we have seen on investment side might have been driven by uh, the government capex. Uh, but we hope that once this uh, uncertainty about the global as well as local factors, which kind of bogged us down in, in 2022, once this uncertainty gets over, uh, the private capex pickup could be more uh, substantial. For FY24, we have a 7% real investment growth forecast, which by our uh, estimate is quite a good number. Uh, so we are hoping that, that this uh, investment tracker would improve even further going forward as uh, some of the private capex also comes into play along with the public capex, which we do hope will continue in FY24 as well. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Indranil, you have, uh, I think, one of the lowest estimates of GDP growth, even after you have brought it up from the previous 5.2%. Your, uh, I think only you and Nomura have uh, uh, sub 5.5% growth for next year. Why that? I mean, yes, exports will be bad, but uh, this is a, a particularly subdued forecast. Yeah, in the sense that, you know, we see a kind of a, a situation where uh, there is going to be slowdown in export demand. And uh, suppose exports go to zero, for example, 
uh, export growth uh, that will probably impact GDP by 100 basis points. So if you see the history of U.S. recessions, Indian growth uh, typically slows by at least 100 basis points at that point in time. Plus, you have a very unusual situation where we are seeing lending rates go up, not only in nominal terms, but also in real terms as WPI inflation comes down. Uh, we do think the RBI will hike another 50 basis points by April and then maybe cut 100 basis points in the second half of next fiscal. So you have a combination of slowing world growth and rising real lending rates at home, uh, which is why we do think that growth will dip. And in any case, you know, if you are looking at a 7% growth this year, mm. you are virtually saying that, you know, the growth in the next two quarters will average 4.5%. Okay. okay. So 55 for the next year. Uh, Samiran, yeah. uh, you know, while you also talk about the export slowdown, you have actually brought down your current account deficit for next year from, I think, earlier 2.4 to now 2.2. Uh, why that? What will go right? So part of this is uh, that the oil prices forecast for us is uh, closer to $75 uh, average for next year. So we have brought that in. Uh, second is that this uh, trifecta of uh, fertilizer, coal, and edible oil, uh, there the, also the prices have corrected a lot. So next year, we should see the benefit of that coming into our import numbers from these three. Uh, the third factor is from the services side. Uh, we have seen a significant growth in service exports, and it's not just that the software services have been more resilient than what people would have feared, but it's also uh, elements like uh, professional management and consultancy services where uh, the quarterly numbers used to be just about $3 billion. Now they're approaching almost $10 billion quarterly. And the last factor is that the travel services where uh, India typically had a positive balance, it became negative during uh, COVID. And now this is again marginally, gradually trying to move towards a positive territory. And once everything opens up, and this goes back to positive, that would also add to uh, the positive services balance. So if you put all of this together, then it looks like we should have a much more comfortable current account balance uh, next year. Okay. Gentlemen, on that optimistic note, uh, Saviran and Indranil, thank you very much for joining me, for giving us a bird's eye view of what we should expect in FI24. Both of them expect the rupee to strengthen to 79 by the time we get to the end of the year. Already the rupee has strengthened today. On that note, we wrap up on Buzzout. Trading ideas line up for your chart busters.